and we'll we'll get launched. Okay, um, welcome to everyone. Welcome to this, this second CSTP event. event. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an audience. Um, um, Connor, I'm getting, Connor, a, I'm getting a horrible, horrible echo. echo. Any bright idea what I can do about that? Okay, no matter. We'll put up with it if it's not troubling anyone else. Um, so to say, welcome to this session. Uh, I, the way I see CSDV studying terrorism is with quite a lot of emphasis upon context. You know, conceptual precision is, of course, enormously important, but I think we should study uh, a, amorphous and fast changing phenomena like terrorism in interplay with other forces and with an awareness that they can change very quickly, that, you know, terrorism can escalate into guerrilla warfare, perhaps successful insurgency holding territory, something semi-conventional, even civil war, but it can also escalate down that scale again very fast. So we are dealing with a shape-shifting and mercurial uh, phenomenon. And sort of apropos of that point, really, we also need to study terrorism in conjunction with counterterrorism, but it's remarkable how rarely we actually do so. You know, counterterrorism does have literatures, but it tends to be less well studied. And I think that's especially uh, necessary when we look at what I hope you'll forgive my calling the sort of terrorist super league, the kind of groups that break through to cause really long running conflicts over decades and with casualties in their tens of thousands of fatalities, the sort of Shining Path, ISIS, or um, tonight's uh, subject, Boko Haram. And we could have no better guide to this shadow world than tonight's speaker and our new member and cherished colleague of CSDBV staff, Amani. It's no exaggeration. I realize it may sound like cheap flattery, but it's very sincere flattery to say Amani has one of the most impressive early career, academic career CVs I've ever seen. Uh, he showed early academic promise by deciding not to pursue business studies further, which um, always impresses me, uh, if you'll forgive my saying so, uh, before turning to a PhD at King's College uh, London in their renowned uh, Department of War Studies in 2015, following on to temporary positions there at King's, uh, and then a position in African politics at the University of Leicester before joining CSDPV in September of this year. This rapid career progression has been accompanied by a brace of teaching awards uh, and also a really impressive bombardment of heavyweight publications, both articles and books. He's the only man I know who has, I believe, three book manuscripts on the go at the moment, um, but already safely completed our insurgency in war in Nigeria with the uh, esteemed IB Taurus publisher 2019 and uh, the seminal um, required reading in amongst higher echelons of Nigerian ministry, uh, military uh, military operations against Boko Haram, which is, you can see, is a, a serious uh, heavyweight production. Counterinsurgency in Nigeria, it's in, entitled uh, The Nigerian Operations Against Boko Haram 2011 to 2017. And this is a sort of field that many has really carved out for himself of being the absolute go-to leading scholar on uh, the Nigerian state's counterinsurgency efforts against Boko Haram at various levels, including a forthcoming study uh, on the police. I don't want to uh, anticipate his remarks tonight. Um, you know, it's, it can be the case in, in movie terms that uh, sequels are every bit as good as uh, the original, thinking of Godfather and Godfather 2, uh, if not better. Uh, and tonight's uh, title, to me, sounds like uh, something of a sequel to the book, who say if the book was counterinsurgency in Nigeria, um, 2011 to 2017, uh, he's speaking to us tonight on the title, quote, insurgency in war in Nigeria, a conversation in the Nigerian, on the Nigerian army's adaptations, July, 2017 to date. So up to the present moment. Um, of course, many can speak for himself, but my understanding is this is a sort of PowerPoint uh, based presentation. So please do uh, view it in full screen mode to so you don't miss any text. Um, the format will be a meeting will speak for 30 minutes, 35 minutes, something like that. And then we'll throw it open to general discussion. 
So, Amani, it's very good to have you with us virtually, though it has to be. Um, I'm going to hand over to you now. Uh, Ameni, you're on mute. Not sure if you, you realise that. Can everyone hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Um, so I said um, terrorism and counterterrorism are not the novelty that they used to be. Um, I think that over the last, certainly the last couple of decades, um, and the last decade in particular, um, I think that more and more people, unfortunately, have been exposed to both the threat of terrorism and the way the states respond. And I think that this has led us to develop a narrative or paint a picture, if you like. Um, and armed group respond um, emerges, I should say, um, conducts an act that shocks the conscience. Um, a lot of people are hurt, sometimes very badly, and then a government has to respond. Now, what we see initially is that the response tends to focus on a preponderance of force. Um, after all, these threats are seen as small groups that can be easily defeated. Over time, we begin to see nuances in that response as governments realize that the threats, in fact, as Tim alluded to, um, are a bit more complex and are sort of a proteus problem. They are shape-shifting. And so military force alone might not be enough. In fact, depending on who you speak to, you might hear things like the wind of hearts and minds, the construction of infrastructure, um, and just befriending locals uh, might be a better way to counter terror. So where does Nigeria fit into this narrative? My name is Ameni, and today I shall be talking to you about the Nigeria experience of terrorism and counterterrorism, um, with emphasis on adaptations. Okay, so proceeding from there, I think broadly our agenda would be split into four. Um, I shall talk about the threats of Boko Haram, and then I shall talk about the counterinsurgency or counterterrorism response or CT coin, a combination of both, as it's called in the Nigerian uh, military operational environment. Um, in starting with the question of what a military campaign is, I shall then go into the Nigerian army case and talk a bit about my research. Uh, but the meat of the presentation is going to be on adapting for war. Um, and I shall talk quite a bit on mobile strike teams and the Nigerian army's super camps. And then I shall offer my final thoughts. Okay. For some background, Boko Haram began waging its insurgency in 2010. Its leader is this individual, Abu Shekau. Um, their stated goals, at least initially, were the establishment of a caliphate in Nigeria. And the main operations of this movement were in the northeast of Nigeria. However, the threat has metastasized. Over time, Boko Haram and its affiliates are now known to operate in Chad, Niger, Cameroon, and even Mali. Yes, Mali. More on this shortly. So Boko Haram operates on two fronts. A covert front which conducts guerrilla attacks. This front is technically proficient in the use of IEDs, explosive devices and it embraces martyrdom operations in its entirety. By this, I mean that Boko Haram has no issues whatsoever exploiting children and pregnant women as suicide bombers. Boko Haram also operates on a second front, an overt front. Think of this as a standing army, right? 
that can field and has fielded thousands of bandolier fighters, motorized infantry, armor, and anti-aircraft capabilities. Now, this overt front can attack in swarms, meaning over a thousand fighters in a single massive offensive, or it can attack in small bursts. Um, and these fighters aren't your average fighter without any skill with a rifle. In fact, a lot of them are skilled riflemen. And Boko Haram's fighters are also trained in, I would say, even beyond the rudiments of infantry tactics, ambush, counter ambush. As far back as 2012, this movement already had highly efficient snipers employing the relatively sophisticated PSG-1 sniper rifles. A key feature of the overt fronts, which we are going to sort of lean into when we discuss the mobile strike teams by the Nigerian army, is that it emphasizes mobility and motorized infantry attacks. And in fact, this overt front has been instrumental to Boko Haram's territorial ambition. There are two major factions today, uh, the Islamic State, West Africa, and then Shekau's own faction, JAS, right? Boko Haram has been responsible for millions of displacements due to the kind of territories it has contested or controlled. And in fact, over 30,000 people have been killed as of 2020 or have been killed, um, I should say, um, in relation to the insurgency. So Boko Haram might not have been directly responsible, but those killed at this number um, were killed as a result of the conflict. Um, so these are very, very um, tr um, troubling numbers. And since 2014, Boko Haram emerged as one of the world's deadliest Islamist terror groups. And 2014 is an interesting year because that was um, Daesh's um, um, infamous march on Mosul, and uh, which which sort of um, was a key incident in its um, march to proto-statehood. Um, but what we find out that in that year, and in fact, in the 12 months leading into that year, Boko Haram nevertheless um, had an increased um, uh, death tally um, compared to any other group in the world, right? And so that includes groups in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Nevertheless, this group is complicated, right? So when we say Boko Haram, I think it's important for us to understand that it's it's not quite just a single name here for a range of reasons. The infighting since 2012, which came to a headway um, in 2016, the shifts in the jihadist landscape in the Sahel, the escalated rivalry between Daesh, the Islamic State, and Al Qaeda, which found its way into the Sahel and Northeast Nigeria. Pardon me. And factors such as these have effectively defined Boko Haram's factions, affiliates, and areas of activity. As examples, we see that JAS, which is Shekau's faction, is a major rival of the Islamic State West Africa, which swore allegiance to Abu Bakr Baghdadi, the now late um, head of Daesh in 2016. Shekau did not swear allegiance to the so-called Caliph of the Islamic State. In 2019, um, the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara was another group, has been another group fighting both the government, but also um, an Al Qaeda affiliate, um, JNIM, in Mali and also in the border areas of Burkina Faso. Um, and in 2019, ISGS was placed under ISWA by Daesh. And so since then, attacks by ISGS were then attributed to ISWA, right? So if it sounds a bit complicated, that's because it is. You never really know who conducted what attack or where exactly Boko Haram is operating or what exactly the group stands for in some cases. So we are talking about some bloodlines. So what I've tried to do is that I've tried to summarize um, what groups can be linked to Boko Haram and then also highlight um, a couple of the other main groups in the Sahel region, JNMI and Ansar ul Islam. Okay, so let's, and I would, I've said all that with the caveat of me not being remotely, you know, you know, knowledgeable in, in Boko Haram and what the group stands for, okay? My area of core expertise is the Nigerian army and its operations, its doctrine um, and its culture. 
right? So this is a more, much more comfortable territory for me, but I felt that would be useful to some in the audience as some context. Okay, so we talk about the Nigerian army's campaign and the army is the main actor um, responding to Boko Haram's threats via a military campaign. So when we talk about a military campaign, we should think of a campaign as the stringing together of a bunch of operations to achieve a strategic objective. And a key political objective for the Nigerian government is security in the Northeast, right? And the Nigerian army's campaign has been strategically aligned with this, i.e. to bring an end to Boko Haram's threat. And so counterinsurgency operations since 2011 have been prosecuted as part of that objective. So this slide has quite a bit of text. Don't worry, I shall go through each um, uh, phase of the, of the counterinsurgency and hopefully clarify uh, without you having to read every single bit of text here. Let's start by saying that a military campaign has two underpinning features, and this is very important. A campaign has to have a sponsor, right? A primary sponsor, if you like. In this case, and I like as an example, I should say the Nigerian army. The campaign also needs to have a time period, right? Um, in this case, 2011 to date. So in the first phase of the Nigerian military's counterinsurgency, or I should say um, the Nigerian army, um, because it's been the dominant actor, uh, that first phase from 2011 to 2013 um, was sponsored by defense headquarters instead of army headquarters. Why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant because when the army took over in 2013, uh, the counterinsurgency became a lot more infantry centric. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. But what we do need to remember in the period leading up to 2013 is that when defense quarters was in charge, there was more of a joint effort in place. So the army, the air force, even the navy, the uh, special uh, boat squad, um, and the police, the intelligence, and all that. There was more of a chance for these guys to walk together in closer intimacy, uh, right? But by 2013, as the insurgency kept getting worse, um, 3,000 troops, which was around the size of troops um, in place before then, was no longer enough to contain this enemy, right? So the army takes over and then the campaign becomes a lot more infantry centric. Um, this was partially because the army had always leaned heavily into its infantry, right? The infantry was the main um, uh, core of the army. And so I guess it's kind of like what uh, Abraham Maslow says, that when you have a hammer, everything turns to a nail, right? If your infantry is your go-to, then you would tend to um, employ that um, when you see a problem. And so true to form, the Nigerian army um, creates a new division, uh, seven infantry division. In fact, this was its first army division in decades. So we can think of this as the first troop surge. Okay. But by 2015, even this wasn't working. 2015 is a very interesting year because it was an election year. Um, that's a key point for us to remember. And so we could see a sense of desperation in the Nigerian army's response to Boko Haram at this period. Um, South African, um, private military security contractors, PMSCs, what some people uh, maybe pejoratively refer to as mercenaries, uh, were called in, were hired. Uh, there were Ukrainian and Czech technical operators were also hired. Uh, the British military assistance training team, BMATS, also stepped up efforts to train Nigerian army battalions. And the army also had an agreement with the Chadian and Cameroonian militaries that Boko Haram could be chased both sides of the border within uh, certain limits. Okay, so all this to try to contain this threat for the elections, uh, because Boko Haram had really run rampant during that period and seized a lot of territory. However, this was not to be, and Boko Haram's threat kept expanding. A new president was elected, the old president lost the elections. The new president, Muhammadu Buhari, appoints three new service chiefs, um, like so. And the chief of the army staff, um, uh, Buratai uh, effectively then starts a new operation from 2015, uh, Operation Lafia Dole, uh, effectively means a uh, uh, peace peace by force um, in the local Hausa dialect. And what this operation was meant to be was that it was really meant to clamp down on Boko Haram. So we saw more troops, 
we saw more investments in armor, in artillery, um, um, in, and in air platforms and so on and so forth. And so it really became almost a full on war against, against this enemy. Um, and in this period, the army started to adapt, right? Um, it launched its mobile brigade concepts. It launched its, its first new motorcycle units as part of 25 Task Force Brigade. And it also launched its mobile strike teams initiative, um, which is what we will spend quite a bit of time discussing today. Okay, my research, um, I think that some of the areas um, that really um, animate me are quite quirky. Right, I look at things like vehicle maintenance, engineering support, um, and, and, um, and the role of engineers in war. Uh, I, I think this leans a bit into my, my background as an engineer. Um, but broadly speaking, my research focuses on things like small wars, military operations, counterinsurgency, and more recently, policing. However, my area of particular expertise is the Nigerian military, especially the army, its history, its culture, its doctrine, its operations. I also study things like how military forces prosecuting counterinsurgency innovate and adapt. And one such adaptation um, within the Nigerian army campaign is the mobile strike teams concept. But we've said this a few times already. What is a mobile strike team? As some background, land warfare is historically dependent on two components. Let's watch a small movie and then we'll take it from there. So is there an in-between, right? Is it the case that you have to either send in the really heavy ammo or send in the really light but much quicker guys? Or could you sort of find a way in between uh, both um, tried and tested approaches on land warfare? Well, as a point, in fact, there is an in-between, the mobile strike team. A mobile strike team is light and maneuverable, it is heavily dependent on motorized assets, okay? But it has sufficient firepower to engage, chase, and hold positions in situ until larger forces arrive. A mobile strike team in this context is more manageable than a heavy unit when it comes to logistics, right? And I think units uh, um, um, like this also have a high degree of tactical oversight. In this sense, they function a bit like battalions. Okay, more on this shortly. To summarize, I'll say that mobile strike teams have medium firepower, very high mobility, high communications, and high reconnaissance capabilities. Now, Boko Haram's highly mobile operations forced the Nigerian army to adopt a variant of this mobile warfare concept. Let's talk a bit more about the history of, of uh, mobile strike teams and why they are so important to um, land warfare today. So an MSD at its core is a larger compound of the QROF, the Quick Reaction Force. Now, QROFs have been used by armies for decades to respond to security situations that were still developing, which did not have a full military response already in place. However, reinforced fire units, and this is very important, that employed a blend of firepower, mobility, and air support were not developed until the post-Cold War era, and units that employed this concept were called the Mobile Strike Force. Incidentally, the Russians are probably to thank for increased military interest and development in this space. 
let's look at a case study to um, underscore this point. So Russia played a key role in persuading um, um, Slobodan Milosevic to end the Kosovo War and so expected to police its own sector of Kosovo independent of NATO. Now, when the Russians didn't get this, they felt double-crossed. And as NATO's K4 peacekeepers were preparing to enter the province, they discovered the Russians were already there by the 12th of June, 1999. How did the Russians pull this off? By a mobile strike force of 200 troops and a series of BTR-type vehicles, right? This swift maneuver caught NATO completely unawares. Wesley Clark was, was, was horrified. Clark was um, the uh, NATO Supreme Commander, and he sort of ordered that 500 British and French paratroopers be put on standby, right? We need to occupy Pristina Airport. We need to cut off the Russian contingent. We need to block the runway. We need to send the message. General Sir Mike Jackson, the K-4 commander, looked at the, the operational orders in front of him, and he refused. He refused to carry out his superior's order, right? Jackson conceded that his forces had already been blindsided by the Russians. NATO's forces were simply too slow on the occasion, and Jackson refused to antagonize the Russians even further by confronting them at Pristina. Instead, I think quite wisely, he decided to hold talks with General Zavazin, the Russian MSF commander, right? And this is a true story. The Pristina airport's incident was diffused through diplomacy and a good bit of whiskey shared between both commanders in the ring. Now, what I don't know and what I couldn't find was the brand of whiskey um, shared between both men, but I can confirm that Blue Label would have been an excellent choice if I was asked. Okay, so we had this um, heated exchange where um, Jackson tells like, well, I'm not going to start world, uh, the Third World War for you, mate. Uh, but political intrigue aside, I think that the manner in which the Russian MSTs outmaneuvered NATO forces um, at Pristina, it certainly piqued um, Western military interests. There was evidently room for land warfare innovation in this space. Okay. And so we started to see um, other militaries employ similar maneuvers. Uh, the British Royal Marines um, Operation Jakana in Afghanistan um, three years later. Um, and the Sri Lankan army in the fourth Tamil Elam war um, also employed a similar um, uh, concept. And of course, the US Army's um, striker mobile brigades. I talk a, a bit more about the striker mobile brigades in my, in my second book. Um, but the brigade, those are the striker brigades effectively filled a decade long gap in US strategic forces, right? Between lighter, lower intensity operations and the heavier um, operations um, or um, activity carried out by, 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 by heavy forces and the uh, um, M1 uh, Abrams tanks. So I guess we can say that by the later half of the 2000s, um, the MSF concept had gained traction within many military operations. So let's bring this into the Nigeria con uh, context. Um, for those wondering why we're talking about the Sri Lanka approach and uh, the, uh, the NATO Cold War um, um, incident, well, a post-Cold War incident, I should say. Well, all four cases are actually part of the Land Warfare Symposium um, during senior division or, or staff course at the Nigerian Army Command and Staff College. Okay, uh, so that's the course that um, uh, captains take to become majors. Uh, but also, um, these case studies also feature in the Nigerian Army um, Armour School at Bauchi as well. So what we see from these cases um, is that, well, while that area of land warfare was being developed, um, it wasn't until maybe uh, beyond the turn of the century, really, that it really gained traction. And the Nigerian army didn't develop this concept during the Civil War, although it, it, it certainly, in my view, had room to do so, or even in the subsequent decades. And I think this was largely because echelons above brigade never demonstrably bought into the MST's concept. Okay. Instead, we saw that ammo and infantry were the main. In fact, even artillery uh, was also largely neglected. I'll be happy to take questions on that during the Q&A. And so it wasn't until 2017 that the first MST was inducted um, into Operation Lafia Dole, uh, the operation against Boko Haram. So how does an MST function, right? A company, B company, each company has 150 troops, 
each company is commanded by a, a first lieutenant or a captain. Um, in reality, um, and, and sorry, uh, uh, combined or together, uh, an MST is then commanded by an officer commanding typically at the rank of major. In reality, however, majors didn't always command MSTs. What we saw was that captains um, actually filled that uh, command space. Um, a bit unusual, but I'll, I'll talk about this shortly, which you'll understand why. But as we see from the previous slides, MSTs generally have many, not all, but many of the organizational features of a battalion, including being led by an officer commanding at the rank of major. And these are flexible units, right? So each sub team can undertake missions independently, but they can also work together to contain a larger threat. And the MST's key strengths are um, its lean uh, command structure, certainly the experience um, brought to bear by the MSTL, uh, the, uh, the, the team leader, which is why it's somewhat problematic that younger and less experienced officers were commanding MSTs in Nigeria. Um, and also the fact that um, the units had a lot of skill and specialization. There were lots of different interesting composites, as we shall see. And I think that these strengths were meant to create, and we shall see this um, quite a bit over the next few slides, a balance of mobility, communications, firepower, and speed, including deployment speed. And so the Nigerian Army inaugurated its own variant by July 2017, um, because it wanted um, these units, quite apart from the mobile brigades, to also engage in their own independent operations. And so I think a key point around an MST is that it is highly dependent on light armored mobility assets, okay? And so things like MRAPs, AFVs, infantry fighting vehicles, and similar assets are at its core, um, on the one hand. On the other hand, I also want us to not be so focused on this mobility angle that we don't see another key strength of MSTs, right? We should view MSTs as being highly integrated units, okay? In the case of Nigeria, we see the MSTs working um, with very close in intimacy with the Nigerian Air Force. As an example, each MST has an air liaison officer at the rank of flight lieutenant, okay, to facilitate better close air support. Now, having an air liaison officer is not quite the same as having an air component commander at the rank of Commodore, which is kind of the case during a joint context. So I guess what we can say here is that the integration between the branches in the Army's MSTs was combined rather than joint. And all these features and strengths um, give the Army's MSTs the ability to pursue the insurgents across rough terrain, over long distances, into deep forests. And crucially, MSTs could also uh, destroy uh, large enemy camps and logistics dumps uh, due to um, NAF or uh, Nigerian Air Force integration and the ability to call for airstrikes. So within Operation Lafia Dole, um, the operation against Boko Haram, there were a, a total of 48 MSTs um, and these MSTs were more maneuverable and more responsive to proximate insurgent threats compared to brigades, which, which were almost an order of magnitude bigger than these units. And so the first three MSTs, um, MST 1, 2, and 3, covered uh, Medugri, Bama, Banki, Dikwa, Gamburu, Damboa, and Biu. And these MSTs came equipped with both A and B vehicles. So uh, in, in military parlance, an A vehicle is a tracked or wheeled vehicle um, for offensive purposes. And the B vehicle is almost like a supporting vehicle, um, if you like, um, meant for defensive or, or support pur uh, purposes. And so each unit came with both A and B vehicles, including gun trucks, fuel bowsers, TCVs, uh, tracked uh, vehicles, and interestingly, even UAVs, or what some folks are pejoratively referred to as drones. And for all these reasons, MSTs were considered at echelons above brigade in the Nigerian Army to be the tip of the spear. They were viewed as being able to strike as hard as a regular combat battalion, except they were far more mobile and streamlined in pretty much every way. However, these units had challenges, okay? 
Chunzu says that speed is the essence of momentum. Speed is the essence of momentum, right? If you have a unit that is highly dependent on vehicles, these vehicles need to be maintained. Okay, and let's remember that these aren't your everyday vehicles that are kind of not really worked that hard. No, 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 no. Vehicles in mobile strike teams walk in extreme heat and dust. They drive at speed over rough terrain. They fire guns while they're at it every single day, right? So a maintenance or non-combat engineering unit is required in situ to support service and maintain them. Okay. So with mobile assets at the core of MSTs, I guess it's easy to understand why um, logistics and repairs are the key challenges. And to further understand why, let's introduce a new actor, the Nigerian Army Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, Naeem. So Naeem has historically provided electrical and mechanical support, repair and maintenance of the Army's land assets, and increasingly today of its UAVs, its, its drones, okay? Um, now, maintenance and support typically occurs in rare workshops, but they can also be taken, undertaken, I should say, in forward areas, especially during operations. Now, historically for Naeem, workshops as far back as Lagos had been tasked pairs of platforms, right? This is Lagos down there. Um, however, we shouldn't confuse uh, peacetime repairs with um, wartime or repairs going on uh, during operations, right? During operations, there had to be a forward presence. You couldn't tow your um, faulty um, 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 infantry fighting vehicle all the way down here to Lagos, right? So there are various repair scenarios I've outlined here, right? Scenario one is that you have a forward repair team right there in the field to help you fix the vehicle. Scenario two is that you tow your vehicles maybe from there to there, right? The same states, right? Yeah. And scenario three is that you tow it all the way back to Lagos. This is a blessing and a curse because the Lagos workshops would have the most parts, the most experience, yeah. but also it's too far away. Okay, so there had to be an alternative on site. And that's why MSTs had what we call a forward repair team, right? In addition to its six man ordinance uh, disposal unit. Okay, the forward repair team was crucial. This was the team that effectively repaired um, all faulty vehicles after ambushes, after you know a long day um, right there in the field. In addition, there was a repair and recovery task force um, in Medugri, so also in Borno State, but not necessarily out there in the outfield spaces um, to assist with vehicular uh, repairs. Um, and where such repairs were not uh, re um, possible, vehicles were then recovered rearward to a higher Naim workshop facility. In practice, however, we find that a whole bunch of logistical challenges uh, meant that um, Naim, uh, the um, recovery task force teams, and even the Ford repair teams often had very problematic tasks. Okay, so challenges here include insufficient skilled manpower, lack of necessary spare parts, um, and also paper never quite matched reality, right? So an MSD might uh, be required to have say 30 vehicles, uh, but in practice might only have six operational vehicles, okay? Um, an example of manpower might be that, well, because Naeem never really had a major forward presence, vehicular testing was slow, pre-delivery in um, inspection and pre-procurement uh, testing trials were also not as thorough. As another example of the manpower challenge, um, typically in the Nigerian army, um, a brigade moves with its brigade workshop, which is split into a main repair group and a forward repair group in order to facilitate repairs far as far forward, uh, forward as possible. In reality, due to the size of the operational theater um, and also due to the sheer number of MSTs, 48, remember, um, it simply wasn't possible to move these guys around, the main repair groups and the Ford repair groups. This then left us with the Ford repair teams as the main support option. A Ford repair team has the six times ordnance disposal unit and six times nine engineers. It's not a very big team, right? So it's not always possible for these guys to be e efficient at their, at their job. Um, also because uh, there was a lack of standardization of parts. Let's say you had um, an MRAP, a mine resistance and bush protected vehicle um, that basically had an overheated gun. You would need to take out the gun from its mount, fix the gun and put it back on the mount. Now, let's say the mount was damaged. 
you don't have a mount to put it on. And because you don't have standardized parts, you need to basically take put the mount, um, the vehicle and the gun back to a rear uh, workshop to find the right parts. It's it's very clumsy, okay, um, the lack of standardization. Um, and also, there was also a lack of full vehicle complements. Uh, things like um, fully provisioned ambulance services were not always available, and this limited unit functionality. There was also a very interesting challenge identified, um, which was um, the fact that um, this, this, the skill levels uh, um, amongst the uh, Ford repair teams varied quite dramatically. So if you had a Ford repair team that was trained on the particular user manuals of the vehicles, that team tended to be a lot more efficient than a team that wasn't trained on the particular manuals and had to improvise because they had never actually seen this vehicle in um, the uh, in engineering school. Um, and a final point here is the command challenges. We alluded to this before. Let me now highlight why this was such a challenge. So because the Nigerian Army didn't have enough um, officers at rank of Major SO2 and Lieutenant Colonels SO1 available to take up command positions, um, what we then saw um, was that um, officers at the rank of Captain and never hired a Major started commanding MSTs. In fact, by 2017, only one of the three operational MSTs actually had fully um, um, was sorry was fully provisioned with the highest rank uh, officers uh, designated. So uh, command was a real uh, challenge. Okay, so what does all this imply? What are the implications of all this? Well, as a result of the fact that MSTs had all these challenges, they simply weren't functioning as intended, and the outcome was that by 2019. The Army said, look, this isn't really working. We need to try something else. We need to adapt in a different way. And so it shifted to its SuperCamps concept. And this brings us to SuperCamps, right? To understand what a SuperCamp is, you need to go back in history to understand what a main operating base is. Now, bases like that were built, they were very large bases, um, and they were built to be able to project force into an enemy's um, territory. Um, these were very large logistics and administrative operations uh, that were going on there, and they were used across the world by different armies. And so Nigeria, the Nigerian army inducted uh, this concept into its operations uh, because its argument was that, well, we had to move away from mobile strike teams because we need to concentrate resources, okay? Mobile strike teams, remember, there were too many of them. They took away resources. They needed to aggregate those resources to see if operations would be more effective against Boko Haram. And so the concept was designated um, the Nigerian Army Super Camps NASCs and inaugurated in 2019. And so consequently, the Army decided to trial a number of NASCs. First was at Molai, and then at Dambor, Buratai, Mongono. Now, the size of these camps meant that Boko Haram never really bothered to attack as they did in the past, okay? These camps were so huge that the enemy simply couldn't penetrate them. And so it seemed like even, even, even uh, camps, I should say, like NASC, Bama, that were regularly attacked, always held, okay? And so it seemed, in a sense, that this was a new breed of Nigerian army installation, okay? And so the army redeployed more troops aggregated its resources and built more super camps at Gamburu and Gala, at Dekwa, at Konduga, at Damask, at Bama, at Baga, at Kroskawa. Again, the formula proved successful. Boko Haram couldn't penetrate these camps as effectively as it had done in the past. So three more were built at Medugri, at Benishik and at Buniyadi. And on and on and on, okay? Until by January 2020, the army had 20 super camps operational. Okay, so what are the differences between super camps and MSTs? Briefly, super camps were meant to aggregate operational resources. MSTs were meant to disaggregate resources. Super camps emphasized the defense, first of all, they were very hard to penetrate. MSCs, on the other hand, emphasized the offense. Super camps 
on the one hand, integrated seamless integration, um, encouraged, I should say, seamless integration. So there, were, was a, there was a range of tasks, there was a range of command and admin functions, there was very extensive logistics. MSDs didn't really encourage seamless operations. They tended to be task oriented. MOBs were built to coordinate maneuver units up to divisional level, right? So up to 10,000 men. Um, sorry, that's um, for super camps or NASCs. MSTs, on the other hand, were not built to maneuver at scale, right? 300 was the maximum around that number. And finally, um, um, main operating bases had been a wartime practice deep into military history. And MSTs, on the other hand, were a relatively new operational concept. And what were the implications of the shift? Well, on the one hand, it meant that the Nigerian army was better protected, okay, because of the size of the camps. But uh, it also brought about some negatives. Boko Haram has become bolder. It has captured more, or rather, old territories, and it can now conduct raids without fear of rapid response. The argument, I guess, was sort of, well, if we don't attack the base directly, we can capture all the small towns around and harass the Nigerian army and never really have them respond unless we attack the base. Um, so while there might not be a correlation between the end of the MST's concept and the increase in attacks in 2017, it's certainly identifiable. And so the New York Times sort of writes that, well, um, the army argues that super camps are a new, more effective way of dealing with an insurgency that has become more complicated, right? But on the other hand, some Nigerian officials have called the super camps an outright retreat, right? Saying that soldiers were merely barricading themselves inside these installations. Not quite sure about that, but there we are. So final thoughts and summary. Earlier, I provided some background to the MST's concept. I, part of the reason for this was that I wanted to show that this approach was not an invention by the Nigerian army, right? It had been established in land warfare. Nevertheless, as I argue elsewhere, MSTs are an innovation for three reasons. They helped the Nigerian army change its CONOPS, its concept of operations. They helped the Nigerian army adjust its relation to the other combat arms, in this case, the Air Force. And they also helped the army downgrade its emphasis on traditional missions in preference to what the MSTs brought to the table. So MSTs along these lines are an instance of innovation. Yes, they didn't work the way they were intended, but that was because they had a range of challenges. I still think the theory remains sound. Um, and even though they didn't lead to the defeat of Boko Haram, they nevertheless had battlefield impact. And this is important because battlefield impact runs through the literature on military innovation. So regarding Nigerian army super camps, are this the future of coin in Nigeria? Well, maybe, maybe not, okay? What we see is that favoring one approach or adaptation over another has its pros and cons. And we see that in the shift from MSTs to super camps, in war, just like in life, there are always trade-offs, right? And I would end this by saying that time and hindsight are often the best judges of whether the decisions we make are the right ones. Thank you very much for your time. Over to you, Tim, Connor. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, Maybe if you just move, mainly I think we have to, our microphones kind of set each other off, so we'll have to just toggle, switch back and forth. Um, thank you so much, Amani, for a very clear, very wide ranging um, presentation of an enormously complex and fast changing landscape. And if I may say so, you know, distinguished by an authoritative command of detail, sensitivity to unexpected consequences, and also with a very cold eyed survey of logistical dilemmas and challenges as you, as you ended with there, including which bottle of whiskey is the appropriate one to head off World War III. So thank you both for the, the overview and the ambition, but also, as I say, for the fine-grained uh, fingertip sensitivity to how these processes actually work. I don't want to hog the discussion, so I'm going to throw it open to uh, questions. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is just use the hands-up function um, so that I can see beside the uh, participant list who uh, who, who's next in the taxi queue, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll take it from there. So, who, who's next? Who wants to, who wants to ask the first question?
There you go, Paddy. I think you're. Uh, I think you've, you've you've taken that one. So over to you. Okay. Uh, well, thanks mainly for the great talk. Really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. I can ask them all now, Tim. Would you rather I just do one at a time? Uh, no, that's grand. Ask a couple. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I guess the first is: is this kind of large-scale response what happens when armies, in particular, are allowed kind of fight? A war rather than a policing action, so to speak. You know, if, if we look at all the other countries, say, you know, we're not at war with this group. They're, you know, they're not a state. Therefore, we can't be at war with them. Is this what happens when you actually recognise the the threat? Um, given the MSTs and kind of how, at least to my ears, sounded like they were quite distinct from other units in in the force. Was there any tension between them? other units were they did they view themselves in any way kind of as elite or distinct or were they, was this just a an idea that needed to be tried and talking about the this kind of the historical legacy of these different approaches is the difference between msts and the super bases essentially the difference between having kind of platoons of dragoons or cavalry versus having castles in previous times thanks Uh, sorry, Omeni, you're muted again. Thank you, Patrick, um, for your response. Um, for your questions, I should say. Uh, so the first question around whether this is effectively what you get when you give um, an army cut blanche to fight a war. Uh, well, well, I, I think my answer would lean towards yes, right? If you if you insist on going down the road of the war model as opposed to as an example the criminal justice model um and then you bring in troops and then you have a general staff take over um and, and sort of fight a war for you then i think it's almost inevitable that your campaign is going to get bigger and bigger right um war is the occupation of military personnel it is understandable and should be expected actually um, that when a general is losing a war, that they insist that more resources, more time, and a bit more patience uh, would allow them to win it. This has happened throughout history. I don't think the Nigerian army is any exception in that regard. Point number two on um, tensions between MSTs and regular units. No, 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 there's, there, was, there was no tension at all because these weren't special units. When I say and it's probably something worth clarifying in the Nigerian uh, military parlance. Special doesn't necessarily mean special in the way you might think. Special just means you've been pulled from one unit, you know, cobbled together with a bunch of other guys and asked to go perform a particular task. The task itself is what makes you special. It's not like you've been specially um, trained for, for, for the task per se. Anyway, to, to the point of the question, uh, these guys weren't special in any way. These guys were just folks that were pulled from um, regular uh, battalions uh, put together, redeployed, uh, sometimes from elsewhere in the Northeast, but sometimes from elsewhere in the country to go fight uh, the insurgents. So um, there was no tension um, to speak of. And around to your final point or question around whether MSTs um, and super camps were similar to castles uh, versus dragoon units. Uh, it's an interesting way to look at it, but I, I guess uh, the point with a castle is that you are much better off um, withstanding a siege as opposed to being a base for outward attack. So I guess in that in that sense, the answer to your question would be kind of yes. Right? A castle is built for defense as opposed to offense, and the dragoon unit um, would, you know, you you would see the reverse. So I, I hope that that answers your questions. Thanks very much, Manny. OK, let's keep the questions coming. Who who wants to go next? Sarah, I think you're you've stolen that one over to you. Uh, thanks, Manny, for a really interesting talk. I, I, in a sense, I kind of want to push that final point that you made to say Sometimes, sometimes not. <laughs> so if you were really on the spot and you were, you know, the Nigerian army is asking for your advice and you've sort of examined all of these dynamics, 
what would you tell them? Because in the, on the one hand, it's sort of a constant process of adaptation. So the enemy adapts, they adapt. Um, but you're sort of arguing that really only time will tell, which I imagine wouldn't go down so well if you actually had to kind of justify and defend a decision. So if I really had to push you um, to say, you know, what would your advice be under those circumstances, given everything that you've laid out, what would it be? It's, just, it's not a fair question, but <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> might still uh, be on mute you. I think yeah uh, thank you Sarah um good question I guess I, I think it is it is a reasonable question I think it's a question that um uh, commanders probably ask themselves every day and um I know I have at least two Nigerian army generals um in in the audience so I'm probably not qualified to fully answer the question but what I will say is that um what the best approach should be well I would say that first of all the army needs to understand while Boko Haram adapts as quickly as it does, right? It's something I'm trying to work on on a project, which may or may not see the light of day. Um, it's a concept around anti-fragility. So I guess the question that I'm asking and I'm sort of trying to study is why do um, terrorist groups uh, adapt so quickly and why do they respond to pressure, not by capitulating, or simply merely being resilient, but to actually get in by actually getting better. If you look at Boko Haram in the first um, couple of years of its existence, right? You you had a group that was pretty small. The Nigerian Army responds by sort of um, going to um, um, th um, um, th was, um, as it's um, tw twenty one Ahmad Brigade um, um, in in Medugri, and then mobilizing seventy nine composite group, the Air Force unit there and also bringing in the police, bringing in the intelligence forces, working together around 3,000 troops to defeat this enemy, right? It seemed like overkill at the time, but what we saw was that Boko Haram, in response to that number of troops, actually got better, right? By 2013, the army deploys an entire, uh, well, creates an entire new counterinsurgency division, so 10,000 new troops, and so on and so forth. Boko Haram responds by getting even bigger and capturing a lot more territory. By 2015, uh, the army again responds by sort of expanding its campaign. By that time, Boko Haram just really went rampant, both in northeast Nigeria, but also in Chad, in, in Cameroon, we started to see. And, and on and on, whereby every time the army tries to expand its campaign, this enemy gets bigger. So I think the question um, worth asking before the army can sort of figure out how we can respond is why does the enemy, you know, respond in this way? Why is it that our actions very directly make this enemy more of a threat? And I think that if the army can answer that question, then it can figure out how it can become a better counterinsurgent. Am I allowed to follow up, Tim? Or is there yeah, someone sure. else who'd like to come in? Is that okay? <laughs> because that was kind of what the other question that was forming in my mind, which is how do you explain that process of innovation? So, and whether it's innovation or adaptive, uh, you know, adaptation. So if you've got this dynamic between um, opponents who are learning, observing, and developing alternative strategies, how do you explain, like in the context of the um, environment that you're thinking about, how do you explain that? Um, and what do we kind of glean from that? Because you've pointed to the unintended consequences, which is really powerful and obviously a really important thing to consider. Um, but in terms of that process of the dynamic between the opponents, what you mentioned anti-fragility, and I kind of I'd love to just hear some more thoughts about how you seek to explain what's going on. Um, well, I think that innovation in the crucible of war can happen in two ways. It can be um, very haphazard and almost unsystematic. Uh, but it can also be more measured. Um, actually, proponents of the concept of innovation would maybe argue that true innovation needs to be from the bottom, from the ground up, and it has to be haphazard as opposed to driven by uh, the um, rear echelon. Um, in responding to an enemy that seems to sort of um, get better um, at every attempt, it's only it. I guess I guess the, the response would be to look at how the enemy has adapted and then try to counter adapt, right? So if Boko Haram were initially only using uh, milled suicide bombers, right? And then you set up roadblocks that sort of filter out the mills and then Boko Haram then adapts to include female suicide bombers and children, 
then your roadblocks now need to okay also include that um, um, demographic. Now, if beyond that the enemy sort of puts away uh, suicide bombing for a while, and then really comes um, in full force with its um, overt front and sort of keeps um, um, attacking with its motorized infantry. I guess as an army, you might want to adapt by then building um, bases that can sort of pursue the enemy, deny the enemy, um, and focus less on unconventional attacks and focus more on territory recovery, right? So I guess to your question, it's it's very difficult, Sarah, for um, army commanders to be uh, proactive. A lot of the time, what you find is that because of the nature of war, and this this is almost like almost a general feature of war, you can only be reactive because there are so many other things going on that you don't have the space or the time to take a step back and sort of predict what the enemy is going to do next, especially when you're faced with, with an enemy that is so unpredictable by nature. Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, just to echo Amani's point, yes, um, a very warm welcome to those uh, joining us tonight from the Nigerian military. Um, for those of you who have the unenviable day job of dealing with Boko Haram and what to do about it, mm -hmm. uh, you're extremely welcome to this session. It's good to have you here. Um, I think, Sophie, you're next for questions. Hello. Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I think my question's more to do with you had incredibly rare access to actually talking to the Nigerian army about Boko Haram. Um, for me, the biggest parallel was how similar these super camps are when you talk about them to say, for example, Bastion in Afghanistan. So do you think it's possible to use, when you asked, um, is there an in-between, would it be possible to use civilian joint task force and use them either to gain atmospherics and would they help in terms of, for example, um, suicide attackers approaching camp at some point? Uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, well, yeah, I, it's it's. Um, I, I think I think the question of the civilian joint task force is uh, one that the uh, Nigerian army sort of listened to very early on, fairly early on, I should say, in its campaign and try to integrate and it wasn't unusual at all by even 2014 2013 actually uh, to already see um small elements of the C cjtf um uh, working with army units and then by 2014 2015 this sort of gained more traction with some support from the local state government and so on and so forth so i think um faced or rather facing an enemy that is um that has particular traits it's often quite useful to engage locals um, to not only help you understand um, that enemy, but also in some cases help you fight against it. Now, the challenge there is because you are basically walking in close intimacy with um, um, groups that are not military, they are not professionalized, they are not as disciplined. There is always the risk that these guys could go haywire or that they um, might be responsible for things beyond your control, um, or that they simply don't understand or respect the same rules of engagement that that's, um, you might be minded to. So um, on the one hand, the Civilian Joint Task Force, yes, was, I, I guess, in, in a sense, you could say it was part of the in-between approach um, between uh, the light forces and the uh, heavy forces. Uh, but I guess on the other hand, I would always urge some caution um, against sort of leaning too heavily into vigilant uh, vigilantism as a response to to insurgency if that makes sense that's great thank you okay thank you further questions hey um i think catherine you're you're next Yeah, I think I just found the unmute button. Um, yes, I wanted to come at it from a different angle and ask how um, or to what extent protection of civilians has been built into this, given the targeting and use of civilians, including children by Boko Haram. Uh, 
thank you, Catherine. Um, I guess going back to what we said um, originally about the um, the links between uh, strategy um, and operations and tactics in a military campaign, I think that um, invariably civilian protection um, has to be um, an important part of a military campaign. Um, now, it's it might be the case that in some parallel planet, um, militaries kill civilians all the time and in the same or on the same planet militaries never kill civilians or, or rather no civilians are killed as a result of military campaign but i think in the real world where we live in um it's somewhere in between right where you don't know you don't you never set out to cause harm to civilians right uh but civilians tend to be harmed now the question of how do you protect protect against this when you are faced with an enemy that is not so much interested in in sabotaging the military campaign, but it really just wants to cause as much damage as possible to civilians. How can you protect against this? Well, I guess the only way you can fully protect against this is to defeat the enemy, right? Because as long as Boko Haram still exists, there's always going to be a very good chance that civilians are at risk. Remember that this is a formless enemy. This enemy assumed formlessness very early on in its campaign, right? So there is never any sort of telegraphed um, um, approaches to villages that are going to be attacked or army locations that are going to be attacked. Even um, um, reconnaissance and counter reconnaissance is going to be very difficult to, to find out that information. So what you find is that civilians are very often targeted and at risk. To your question of how the army guards against this, well, I think it has tried to do this um, in, I, I think the mobile, um, sorry, not the mobile strike team, the super camps are actually a very good way um, the army has tried to protect against this because all the communities in proximity to a certain extent are more or less protected because the army can respond with extreme force and expect to defeat Boko Haram in every one of those engagements. But when you talk about communities that aren't proximate to the, to the uh, super camps, those communities are very much at risk. And this is why you see Boko Haram tend to preference uh, border communities or very small hamlets that are quite far away from military uh, locations. And I guess the question of how the army can protect both the larger settlements and the smaller ones simultaneously um, is something that's not been fully resolved. And frankly, in I don't think it's ever been resolved in any contemporary case of counterinsurgency. There's always that risk. Perhaps I could just jump on the back of that um, of Catherine's astute question. I'm mean, just as a out of curiosity, where did the slogan "peace by force" come from? Because it, it has a bit of a ring of Tacitus about it, a bit of a kind of they make a desolation and call it peace. It, it doesn't. I mean, I might be wrong and I might be doing a great injustice, but it doesn't sound like protecting civilians is is uh, necessarily foregrounded there. But I may well be wrong. Please tell me I am. It's interesting, and I guess from uh, from from the outside in, it will it will be very easy to to sort of um, see that as 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 the interpretation. But to understand why that phrase was adopted, you need to understand sort of um, um, I should I mean, maybe I should say local Nigerian lexicon. When someone's when a Nigerian says by force, they don't literally mean by force. It just means you know I'm going to do everything I can to make this possible. So it's not force in the literal sense. It's almost a metaphoric use of sense. However, I can see why that's problematic coming from a military whose occupation is force. Um, if I was asked, I'll probably have advised against a, a, a sort of different slogan, but I hope that helps. Thank you. It's unfair of me to uh, hijack my role as chair to ask you that, but I just, um, I thought of uh, Michael Howard, you know, the esteemed military historian, his, um, subversive comment that war was mostly about killing people and breaking things you know that's it's uh, um lingered in the mind okay further questions henning over to you um yes hi hi omeni thanks thanks for the great talk um you may have touched on this but if so then i didn't quite catch it but i was wondering if we think of the Nigerian army itself, does it think of these various factions just as Boko Haram, right? And when there's a tech, it's like Boko Haram, or do you think to the Nigerian army, the distinction between I, ISWA or ISWAP 
and I guess JAS was what you used for the Chicago faction. Does that difference matter, you know, or do they think it's Boko Haram is still the threat, or is it now there's the JAS threat, there's the ISWAP threat, and so on and so forth? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hanin. I think um, we to answer your question, we need to go to the phrase, um, the enemy of my enemy um, is my friend until he becomes my, um, my enemy's enemy again. Um, I guess the point is that when you had um, the two Boko Haram factions in proximity to each other, um, they tend to fight each other and almost neglect um, focusing on the army. And in those times, uh, the Nigerian army was actually very pleased, you know, you know, let them kill themselves and let's, you know, pick up, pick up the pieces. Um, but then you had instances of a Nigerian army, and I talk about this in my, in my second book, a Nigerian army formation being sort of put in the middle of this, of this sort of skirmishes um, between um, um, North Central Bornu and Southern Bornu, where the two different factions were strongest. And what you saw in those instances is that uh, these two factions, without talking to themselves, um, ignored each other and then focused on this Nigerian army formation and wouldn't attack each other until this formation was completely decimated or, or demoralized. Um, I guess the reverse um, is also uh, the case in that, I, oh, oh, sorry, I should say the reverse is not the case because the Nigerian army doesn't really discriminate, right? I don't think the Nigerian, the Nigerian army preferences attacking uh, JES over attacking um, ISWA. Uh, the reason being, um, well, both of them are threats not only to the contiguity of the wrath of Nigerian law, uh, but also to the people, to Nigerian army formations, and so on and so forth. So um, it's not the case that one poses uh, less of a threat. I think both groups are very, very vicious and very deadly. Um, maybe the distinction could be that JAS is more likely to attack civilian um, installations, whereas um, ISWA is more likely to, um, less likely to tax civilian populations and focus on the army. I guess um, with that information in hindsight, the Nigerian army might decide to focus on one group or the other. But in general, I don't think these distinctions are, are, are an operational priority. Great, thank you. Okay, further questions? Paddy, I think the honor is yours. I was uh, waiting to see if anyone else would, hadn't asked a question yet, but I think since they're, not, since they're waiting, Paddy, over to you again. Okay. Um, I guess it's just a rather quick question. Um, again, referring to the Nigerian army. Um, does Is there any kind of tension within the army about having to deal with this problem above other potential kind of uses of resources? Um, you know, other armies don't necessarily enjoy devoting their time to fighting insurgencies or terror groups or whatever it might be, um, and therefore not preparing for the big bad of interstate warfare, or is this recognized as the main task at hand that needs all the resources it, it needs? Uh, thank you. I think, um, um, Patrick, I think initially the army was not fully committed to the fight. Um, and I guess, again, we can see parallels in lots of other counter insurgency campaigns where initially you only see small forces. You don't really see that commitment. But over time, as the reality dawns on the counter insurgents, um, they invest more and more resources. And I think uh, just coming back to the Nigeria case, we, we've certainly seen um, a lot more commitment and a much more robust uh, operational response to um, Boko Haram's threat. Um, in terms of dedication of, of resources to the counterinsurgency, yes, I would say this is pretty much the uh, Nigerian army's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth priority. I think that when and only when Boko Haram is defeated can we say that the army has a other priority because this group is that much of a threat. Um, I think um, the reallocation of resources um, certainly... Uh, to to the northeast is certainly something that might not sit well with um, other um, general officers commanding who are not in the northeast. Uh, but I would say the counter argument would be that for the uh, GOCs um, in the northeast who have to deal with this problem and whose 
jobs may very well depend on on at least um, containing the threat of Boko Haram. They would very much be relieved to see that um, the government and, and and the army is 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 ready to to reallocate additional resources to, to their campaign. Okay, thanks. That's great. Thank you. Um, again, I think uh, I'll, I'll let anyone else in who hasn't asked a question yet. But if there, if other people hanging back, I'll go for. I think the honour is yours, Sophie. Back to you. Oh, can you hear me? I don't yep. know if my hands were. Oh, perfect. Um, sorry to be back again. Uh, just a question popped into my head. So I'm looking more at Burkina Faso, Mali, that type of area. So I think in terms of this, a question that has to be asked is, do you think having good luck, Jonathan, advising on the situation in Mali is going to affect operations in Nigeria? Do you think there will be any feedback from that um, in terms of either advice or how to do things differently? Um, and to be really cheeky, I've got a second question as well, which was you mentioned earlier that there was a lack of majors and that captains were having to step up. Um, so that would indicate a lack of recruitment or manpower. Is that an issue or is there a different reason for it? Uh, thank you, Sophie. Well, um, to your first point, your, I think your, your first question is more of a political one. I, I'm not sure how much of a political person I am. Um, would good Lord Jonathan's intervention have some kind of blowback? Um, I don't have much views on these but i would say i don't see why it should but I, I don't i don't i can't really trace his actions as a um sort of bringer of peace in mali to having some kind of blowback um either from the insurgent groups which aren't really the problem um why he went or from the nigerian government uh, but to the second question um i think after almost a decade of war, I think it's not as simple as just having a recruitment um, challenge. Um, Depot NA certainly has drastically accelerated the range of people, uh, sorry, uh, the, the number of uh, soldiers that it um, trains and, and brings in. And, and I know the CT Coin Center was also moved uh, from, I think it was Niger State to, uh, sorry, was moved to Niger State. Um, and as part of this accelerated um, recruitment for soldiers. But I think your question is related more to officers. And I think that part of the reason why there weren't too many to begin with is there might be an, an unofficial scenario where people aren't too keen to be deployed to the Northeast, right? So if there's any way you can kind of wriggle your way out of it, you probably will. Right, you 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 probably will. Um, I'm not saying it's 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 the best case scenario, but I can sort of see that happening. Um, but I think um, taking my tongue out of my cheek, I, I I think that maybe it could also be that there's a resource issue. It could also be that due to the sheer number of mobile strike teams that were planned to be inaugurated, there simply weren't enough. Um, officers that were not only uh, ready to be deployed, but were also trained in counterterrorism, or at least had some kind of command experience, right? Because remember, you can't just take a major who hasn't had any kind of, who hasn't commanded a battalion, maybe is fresh out of senior diff and doesn't really have experience in counterterrorism specifically. I think it would be unfair to take that officer and just sort of throw him into the thick, right? So I think it would be more reasonable to get those guys trained up, uh, first of all. Um, would putting captains there instead of them be the answer? Well, I don't think so either. So it's it's a difficult situation in any event. What I would also say is that you need to remember that the Nigerian army was drastically scaling up its operations in a short amount of time, right? Before this war started, the Nigerian army was kind of, I think, 62,000 strong, right, in 2008, 2009-ish. And I think in 2015, um, um, Lieutenant General Buratai, the chief of army staff, said that he wanted the army to be at a strength of 140,000, right? How can you build, how can you double the size of an army 
in in six six or five or six years without cutting corners, right? I guess that's a Chinese riddle for everyone. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Well, on that um, resonant note of Chinese riddles, we are moving towards closing minutes. So um, if you have burning questions that you've been wrestling with formulation, uh, wrestle no more and formulate them. Um, but otherwise, I'll, if I may, many just ask you, uh, I'll resist the temptation to ask you the kind of killer Sarah quote, or is it General McChrystal? Tell me how this ends, um, because that's deeply unfair. Uh, I wondered if you could just say a word really about the interface with your future work on the police. I mean, the kind of levels of uh, operations and the kind of intensity of the fighting don't suggest much room for sort of um, uh, police, uh, police involvement. But I know you have looked at that. And I wondered, are there, are there sort of uh, districts on the edge of the insurgency or are there uh, in the early days of the insurgency or or perhaps in a more benign future if the insurgency died down somewhat um how would you see the kind of police and uh, the police role developing here thank you tim i i think um two two points two points there i'll, I'll start with the first one i think that to fully understand uh, just go into what you said about all the police tensions going on. I think to fully understand uh, why the Nigerian police is the institution it is today, you need to go way back to the history, the culture, and the organization of that institution. Um, and I'm talking way back to almost, and I'm saying this seriously, 1861 and the annexation of Lagos, um, way back to then, and then start sort of tracing your way through history. Um, to the question of the role of police in countering insurgency, I think that um, traditionally, police only plays a marginal role in insurgencies. First, because the insurgents tend to see the police as a manifestation of the state that it's fighting. And so they are not very merciful when they attack police installations. Um, second, because Police forces simply don't have the capabilities, the force structure, the combat readiness, or the sustainable capabilities, is what I mean by capabilities, to engage and contain insurgents that are growing from strength to strength, like Boko Haram. And I think that the third point is that when an army takes over a campaign, then the police can only have a role if the army allows it to have a role. And armies generally, um, don't preference police involvement. They might allow uh, police liaisons and maybe even allow component commanders, as was the case during JTF war. And I think also it continued beyond then, actually. Uh, but this tends to be very much um, an army focused response in terms of counterinsurgency. So you will never really see police play central roles. Police men would play a role and incidentally, um, Army personnel don't like uh, doing the role of the police, uh, but the police would never really play even a fraction of the role played by military forces, especially when you have such a persistent, troublesome enemy like Boko Haram. Sorry, Tim, you're on mute. Sorry, fell, to, fell into the meeting trap. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you know, that I think that's true across many different different contexts of integrating armies and police are, is always challenging, whatever the whatever the other dynamics at play. I don't suppose you know of any um, good comparative work when you were talking about uh, early on just about the sheer scale of um, or the human cost of um, the situation of 30,000 dead. I was just thinking, you know, are there any sort of comparative studies with Shining Path or ISIS or the other sort of or the Tamil Tigers or those kind of groups that really do kind of break through to a whole different level of lethality? Uh, I think the fact that um, Los uh, Narcos Traficantes, the, the Narcos in, in Colombia, eventually um, started, um, some of them in any event, started working with FAC and then sort of really expanded FAC's um, insurgency. Um, and so you had almost a drug war that was modeled together with a communist insurgency. So I think that led to really high numbers of casualties. And I think if I'm not mistaken, 
uh, fax um, insurgency still holds the record for the longest insurgency in history. Um, it's certainly up there. Um, I think that kind of complexity, not like any insurgency, is not complex. But I think that kind of complexity um, certainly drives up the numbers because it's no longer the case that you can simply deploy an army battalion to this location and contain a threat there. There's so many other things involved um, that um, the insurgents can basically subvert your efforts in so many ways and really ramp up their casualty numbers. Um, that's maybe one comparison I would make. Otherwise, except we're looking at maybe the Islamic State, which is, as a proto-state, is certainly an outlier um, within the insurgency literature. Um, you don't really see too many groups become as as lethal as Boko Haram have. No, that's that, that was the lines I was thinking along. Okay, um, I think we've worked you very hard, Amani. I think it is, um, so to speak, closing time cocktails at Last Chance Saloon. So uh, ask questions or now or forever hold your peace. Um, no, no, nobody seems to be biting. So I think uh, we've worked you hard and perhaps the audience uh, hard as, as well. Um, thank you so much for an authoritative, wide ranging, detailed, thought provoking presentation. I think the, the liveliness of questions and discussion is, is its own tribute. Um, so uh, it, 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 I guess everyone is muted, but um, get, a, get a virtual clap, um, turn up the volume and uh, thank you so much. It's, it's been a great second session uh, and, you know, I'm sure more informal discussions will will run from this. Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, Tim. And also thank you, Connor. You've been great in helping organize this. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone that tuned in for this, for this talk. This is my first talk at St. Andrews, so it's, it's a big deal to, uh, to me that everyone's here. Thank you very much. Thank you. But Have a good evening. Last. Certainly not the last. All right, then, we'll uh, wrap it up there. My thanks. And um, so next CSTPV events are the mini series of events on the 25th anniversary of the Dayton Peace Agreement that start in a couple of weeks on, I think, 10th of November, but we'll be in touch about that. Um, for now, it just remains to sign off. And um, thank you again. And mainly look forward to reading uh, the work that I know is in the pipeline. Thank you. Okay, thank everyone. You. Thank you. And over and out. Bye. Bye-bye.